As of April, the average house price in Oshawa was $936,000. In April, that was down from the previous month of March 2022, down 7.4%. However, year over year, we were still up 20%. Fast forward to May, as of May 17th, the average house price in Oshawa was $849,000. So that was down 9% from April 2022. And up 10% from May 2021, a year prior. So as you can notice, you know, we are decreasing month over month. We're in a very interesting time in terms of um, market shifting very quickly and shifting on a weekly basis. What does this mean to the market? What does this mean to listings that are out there right now? Uh, we've been seeing a, a large spike in the number of um, terminations. And that's essentially telling me that, look, there is a shift happening in the market. People are either pricing their, pro uh, their properties incorrectly or the seller expectation is completely off. Correction has happened and it is happening and numbers are coming back to more attainable, more realistic numbers. Hey YouTube, this is Andrew and I'm taking over the Canadian Real Estate Channel. I'm so excited to talk about Oshawa today with the resident expert, uh, Saman Habibi. Saman, how are you doing today? Doing well, thank you. Excited to have another video recorded with the Canadian Real Estate Channel. Yeah, now you're a seasoned veteran on this channel, I hear. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, something like that. We've been going at it for a while and our last video did really well. I think we hit 30,000 views and, you know, people were interested in what we were talking about. So let's keep it rolling. Right on, right on. Well, I look forward to hear what you have to say. So why don't we start your presentation and, uh, and go from there. Absolutely. We are going to jump right into it. So again, welcome back to the Canadian Real Estate Channel. My name is Saman Habibi, uh, your, your real estate agent for the Durham region and Oshawa. I've been doing this full time for around two years now, focusing um, on working with uh, investors directly. Um, I'm an investor myself in the Durham region. All my properties are in, in Oshawa. So, you know, something that uh, I love, I believe, um, put my money where my mouth is. So. Um, I hope that this can give you some uh, some confidence when it comes to listening to what I have to say about Oshawa and the Durham region. So what I'd like to do, do today is speak about the Oshawa market and give you an update as to what's going on. And then we'll kind of take that information and compare it to the rest of the GTA. Uh, we'll talk about what's happening in the market right now. Um, you know, we're in a very interesting time in terms of um, market shifting very quickly and shifting on a weekly basis. What does this mean to the market? What does this mean to listings that are out there right now? Um, and since this channel is focused on, uh, you know, providing value to investors, we're going to talk about what you should be doing as an investor today in the Durham region and in Oshawa. Um, and we're going to be talking about numbers and what numbers look like on a turnkey and rehab purchase. Um, and then we're going to just quickly talk about changes that are coming to um, the HELOC and the stress test. Um, and, you know, during this time, if you guys have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comment section below and I will get to those comments um, directly. OK, so let's jump right into it, guys. What's happening in Oshawa? So as of April, the average house price in Oshawa was nine hundred thirty six thousand dollars in April. That was down from the previous month of March twenty twenty two, down seven point four percent. However, year over year, we were still up twenty percent. Fast forward to May, as of May 17th, the average house price in Oshawa was $849,000. So that was down 9% from April 2022 and up 10% from May 2021, a year prior. So as you can notice, you know, we are decreasing month over month. And I believe that this is fairly consistent um, throughout the GTA and throughout the different markets if you actually notice that the year over year numbers have been starting to decrease. So for a very long time, that year over year number was very irrelevant because we kept on growing and every month uh, we would grow up in percentages 
And as a result, the year over year number was also increasing. So it almost came to a point where there's really no need to talk about the year over year number. But I think that's starting to change. You know, in, uh, in April, we were 20 percent in um, in May, we were 10 percent. And I see that actually going down and catching up to May of 2021 of last year. Um, you know, with this, with the price coming, with the prices coming down, um, what I've been doing is I've been focusing in on termination and suspended listings to see where how these are trending essentially in the market. And I find that important because that essentially tells me what's going on in the market in terms of pricing and in terms of expectations, um, seller's expectations. So if we take a look at the data, um, I essentially started tracking this in February because that's when we hit the peak. And I said, let's just see what happens going forward. Um, we got hint that interest rates were going to increase. Um, I thought that that would bring some fear to the market. And as a result, people sitting on the sidelines and perhaps not going to purchase if they were going to purchase, perhaps looking for a deal. So we said, let's start tracking it. So, um, the orange line represents, um, all terminations and suspended listings in Oshawa. And then the blue line represents the Durham region, which includes Pickering, Ajax, Whitby, Oshawa, Clarington. Uh, and then north, we have Scugog and, and the township of Brock. So as you can see in Oshawa, it's been steadily increasing from 52 in February to 212 uh, in, uh, in March, increasing again, 231 in Oshawa. And as we know, in May, the market has really slowed down and as of May 19, 2022, there was 200 terminated listings in, in all of Oshawa. And, you know, that's essentially accounting for 19 days of data. I would expect to see that number climb and get close to 300 uh, terminated listings. And the same essentially follows with the Durham, uh, with the Durham region in, uh, in general and, and overall. Uh, we've been seeing a, a large spike in the number of um, terminations. And that's essentially telling me that, look, there is a shift happening in the market. Um, people are either pricing their pro their properties incorrectly or the seller expectation is completely off and perhaps a real estate professional is not having those conversations that they should be having in order to manage expectations. Listings are sitting on the market, they're not selling, they have to be terminated, you need to come up with a new pricing strategy to be able to essentially go back to market and try and create some, some interest. So Do you find that uh, is is this maybe the 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 tipping point of where the strategy was an offers by date to going back to the traditional model of of a post the price you want? Yeah, that that's a very good comment. Very good comment. I I say um, I'd say we haven't necessarily come to a cross point where that termination, where that determination, and where that timing has been established. Um, there's still a lot of listings that are, you know, pricing low and holding back offers. But I would say there's definitely um, more number of listings that are saying they are open to a preemptive or bully offer. So we're definitely seeing that more. And um, I am seeing properties sell, you know, quicker than, you know, waiting that five day period in order to look at offers. Now that we spoke about the Durham region, um, what I like to do is essentially show you this chart. This is a chart that I created, pulled data from MarketWatch, and then for May, for May 2022, pulled it from my, um, my realtor database. And essentially what we're doing here is we're looking at, um, the first column is looking at May 2021. So what prices were last year? Um, the second column is looking at April 2022. So what prices were in, in the previous month? Then we have um, May 22 numbers as of May 17th. And then what I, what I do is I look at a year over year change of May, 2021 versus May, 2021. Uh, then we look at a month over month change. Then we look at the peak of February uh, versus May of 2022. So I just want to point out before we dive into the details that these uh, numbers are looking at um, average prices. Um, and when we look at average prices, um, you know, there are outliers in these numbers. So in some regions, for example, if you look at the asterisks that I put next to Brock, um, when I look at average prices, the average price was actually higher than the previous month of April, 2022. And that's because there was two very unique transactions that sold over 1.2 million. So in some certain uh, instances, I've looked at the median price where it, it, um, 
will exclude any outliers on the lower end and on the higher end. Um, and we just have to keep in mind that the population uh, for May 2022, in some instances, there are smaller number of sold listings that occurred. So, um, you know, we just have to be cautious with these numbers. They're not, um, you know, it'd be good to kind of compare this to when the May actuals come out by TREP. But for, for analysis purposes, let's just take a look at it. We spoke well, about Oshawa. I'll just not, jump in there and say that, yeah. that that's a really good point that you've brought up is you need to, when you're looking at comps, uh, is, is drop off. If a price looks too low or a price looks too high, those are the ones that you should chop off because there's something going on there that's a unique situation, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if we, yeah, this is really important because it, you know, it, it does have an impact. And especially when we start looking at, you know, our first comparison year over year, um, you know, some people were surprised to see Uxbridge as a, as a town that's very popular in, in very high demand. It's, you know, just around the uh, area of Aurora, New Market. You know, if you look at Aurora, for example, um, year over year, it's still up 23%. And then you look at Uxbridge, which is a town nearby, it's down 12% year over year. So, Andrew, you're, you're an investor uh, yourself, and um, you perhaps have friends that are investing in different areas of, of Ontario, uh, perhaps in the GTA. So if we look at the year over year, uh, we have East Willenberry, which is around the Aurora New Market, um, just in between Aurora and, and Barry in that area. We have King City, again, a town where their investors typically aren't buying there. It's more of like a, a posh area for uh, very high-end homes. We have Uxbridge, and then we have Simcoe County around Barry. Um, are you surprised? Do you know any investors in the area? Um, and then if so, are you aware of the market? And, you know, are you surprised to see, you know, the year over year numbers decreasing? That would be a surprise, uh, very much so. I mean, I, I realize, of course, that every, every sub market can react very differently um, than as a whole. Um, I, I will admit that I don't know very much about the, the East End. I tend mm -hmm. to be a West End investor. Yep. Um, but yeah, like to have, to have neighborhoods that are, are basically bordering each other have such drastic differences. It's very surprising. I, I'd be yes. very curious to understand what your take on that is. Yeah, exactly. I, I think, um, the month over month column and then the, the peak of uh, 22 versus May 22, you start to see, um, more areas on the decline and essentially in the second column, the month over month, what I, what I did was I kind of highlighted um, decreases above the average. So the average that I calculated was around 7%. So I've highlighted anything that's above 7% um, decrease in the, in the second column. And essentially, um, I think the narrative that makes the most sense and, and what I've heard a lot of, uh, a lot of agents talking about is that, you know, the suburbs, especially in Durham um, and Simcoe County, you know, they saw the highest percentage of increase uh, when we had the bull run um, from 2020 until 2022. And naturally, they're expecting those areas that had the highest growth to essentially see the highest correction. Um, and, you know, there's that famous saying of what goes up must come down. And I think that's extremely true right now uh, with Durham Region seeing a big correction. Um, for example, if we look at Durham Region and, we, and if we look at Clarington, Clarington is one town just east of Oshawa, so further away from the GTA, um, and it's seeing a 12% correction. Now, if we look at how much it increased from the peak of 2020 uh, till, till 2022, I think it was around 94% price appreciation uh, in the span of two years. So, um, and I think the same is relevant with the rest of the Durham region. You know, Whitby grew a ton. Uh, I think it was just close to 90% as well and rest of the GTA, so sorry, rest of the Durham region. Um, so as a result, you know, we had a lot of, because we are a town that is uh, on the 401 corridor and on the GO train corridor as well, um, when the pandemic started, it, become, it started becoming a very popular area to go to because of how close um, it is to, to the downtown. And essentially the logic was, well, you know, we're being told that we can work from home and this is going to be a forever thing. So, you know, let's start looking in the suburbs. And typically, if you're working in Toronto uh, and you look at the West End, you have Mississauga, you essentially have Peel. You have Brampton, Mississauga, Caledon, Oakville, Burlington, the Halton area. And those areas, um, even during the pandemic and in early 2021, 
were fairly expensive. Um, average prices were north of the 1.2, 1.3. Whereas the Durham region, the average price was under a million dollars. So I think it naturally created interest, sparked an interest in potential buyers. You know, there's a lot of bigger lots in the Durham region uh, for an affordable price. So that was one of the reasons why we started seeing a lot of people come towards the Durham region. And it's very evident. Um, number of listings were low and number of offers were high and prices were just kept climbing month over month. Um, Are you starting to see that there is, there is that mass exodus from, from like Toronto proper uh, because of the work from home, but are you seeing any indications that maybe there's a bit of a, a reversal of that at all happening? Like people are realizing that they actually do have to go back to work. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's essentially what's happening. I, I'm hearing, you know, friends of mine who are, who work downtown, who were essentially on a work from home model. And now there's that talks of the hybrid model coming in where, you know, you need to be in the office two, three times a week. Um, you know, their, their bosses are in the office and, and they're saying, if we're in the office, we'd like you to come back into the office. So I think that conversation is starting to happen. Um, and people are starting to realize, oh my God, if I need to commute to downtown from Oshawa every day, taking the go train, um, your door to door, depending on where you are in Oshawa, you know, just to get to downtown from Oshawa is a, is about an hour go train ride. And then your door to door, you know, travel from home to go station. And then from a downtown from go station to your office, that could be, you know, one fifteen to an hour 30 door to door. Right. And that's if that's assuming there's no delays on, on the go train line as well. So actually, isn't that and, bad for the GTA? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I was just curious um, on that same sort of topic. You're talking about the, the, the rapid increase in, in property values, of course, like a 90% increase. When, when we say that there's, there's a correction, there's a, there's a dip. I think a lot of people look at it like there is a major loss, mm -hmm. but, but in reality, I, I think that, you know, the, the growth was just so unsustainable that this is, this is just a normal price now that we're seeing things sort of settle back to like the dust is settling. Yeah. But also I'm curious as to the, the difference between the, the higher end more, you know, let's call it luxury and upper class uh, properties versus sort of the entry level first time buyers homes. Mm -hmm. So is, is some of this, some of the, the higher value properties would would usually degrade in price faster or a higher percentage than the entry level. So would you say that maybe some of these numbers are a little bit skewed because of the larger price drop at the top of the market versus the entry level? Yeah, that, that's a very good point that you raise. Um, and, you know, speaking from, I, I've been fortunate to have listings on the higher end and then listings that are more catered, you know, more of like the subdivision, traditional detached home. Um, and you'd be surprised that the high end um, luxury, very particular home that's very unique, um, they're still performing well. So I had a listing in uh, Port Perry, which would be the Scugog area. Um, executive bungalow uh, on um, 89, sorry, on a 101 frontage by 230 um, foot lot um, property, a detached bungalow with a finished basement, a nice backyard. We listed that for 1.5 and we sold that for 1.9 with 16 offers. Um, so those unique properties on bigger lots that have something very unique to offer. So for example, this one was the lot size and the backyard. They're doing fairly well. And even the same type of homes in subdivisions are continuing to do well because it's a, it's a small group of buyers. They're very focused. They're very tunnel visioned as to what they want. Um, based on the experience that I had on my listing, money wasn't an issue. Um, financing wasn't an issue. Um, I find the the big correction comes in the subdivision, the first time home buyers where, you know, that down payment, that 20% is a stretch. Um, they are, you know, they are essentially maxing out savings to a certain degree or getting help from parents to get into that market. Um, and because they don't have a lot of leeway with, um, with affordability, they're very cautious, right? And, you know, myself, if I was representing that type of buyer, I would advise them to be very cautious because if you don't have a lot of cash to play with, right, we're going through a shifting market right now where appraisals are coming back lower than the purchase price. So as a result, 
um, if the appraiser comes in lower, you need to be able to have cash on hand to be able to essentially fund your mortgage, um, or you better have a financing clause to protect yourself. So what that is doing in return to prices is making sure that people aren't going aggressive when they're offering on a property, or if they are, they're going with a financing clause and still being very cautious because they don't want to, they don't want the appraisal to have an impact. So, so yes, it is, it is, the number is likely skewed a bit because there's a lot of transactions happening in, in the subdivision homes. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it's, it's actually the, the opposite of what I thought it would be. So that, mm -hmm. that's interesting in and of itself. Yeah. yeah. And there's actually a chart um, that did suggest that on the higher end, the 1.5 plus um, was actually performing better um, than on the smaller end. So the smaller end as I find where I think I, I made that point where buyers are very cautious. So, you know, they don't have the freedom of money. They don't have unlimited money and they don't have unlimited qualifications. So they need to be very careful. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. So, and then, I mean, you know, if we look at the, I'll just take you to the last column, um, February 22, where, which is where the peak was to May 22. Um, if we look at what's happening, you know, some areas are starting to see a big correction, right? We have, we have, uh, East Gwillimbury, um, Georgina. So that's just North of, um, of the new market area. King seeing 25, 22, um, 34%. Then we go to the Durham region you know, big corrections in the Durham region. Again, I think people are realizing that the numbers they saw in uh, late 2021 and early 2022 were outrageous prices. And essentially, and I think you said it right on, like, you know, this correction is happening. There's not, we don't even need to kind of have a, a, a conversation if a correction is happening, like correction has happened and it is happening and numbers are coming back to more attainable, more realistic numbers. You know, if you've bought a house, this loss is not a realized loss, right? If, if you've bought a house for the purpose of living in there and, you know, going on with your livelihood, um, you're not gambling, you're not speculating. This is somewhere that you're going to be living. And if you have a long horizon, I would say you're more than likely going to go through a cycle where Prices are perhaps going to come back to what they were, um, maybe a bit lower. We don't know, but you know, this is your house. You're living in there. Um, but if you're an investor and you bought with with, with um, reasons of, of speculating, then I would say you're, you know, you, you need to be careful with with what you're doing and kind of reassess your your investment strategies. Yeah, have that have that exit of uh, buy uh, holding rather than uh, exiting sooner than later or. That's right. So um, we spoke about numbers, but what is happening in the market? Um, I think it's relevant to say, and I think it's accurate to say that the Bank of Canada and OSFI, who, who is the regulator, they're finally realizing that there's a problem. So from a Bank of Canada's perspective, if we look at the narrative that they were putting out last year was that we're not going to be touching rates. Um, the housing market's okay. Don't worry about it. Just keep going on. And OSFI was essentially very quiet in the sense of saying we're monitoring, but there's no reason for us to believe that we need to make any changes. But fast forward to 2022 and May of 2022, actually, you know, beginning of 2022, um, the Bank of Canada started um, raising interest rates. So the five-year fixed right now is at approximately 4.8%, and the variable rate is approximately 2.85%. Um, you know, a lot the the word that I'm hearing from the mortgage. Um, agent community is that they're advising people to go with variable right now because of how big of a gap we essentially have a 2% gap between variable and fixed. Um, so, you know, this is having an impact on affordability. People were used to getting, you know, I believe at the lowest, I think it was HSBC, they were offering 0.99% um, interest rates in 2021. So, you know, this is a big jump. It's having an impact on affordability, again, curbing why people can't be paying um, the, the, the crazy numbers that they were paying over asking price. Um, and then OSFI, um, OSFI is coming up and saying that there's going to be, uh, they're speculating changes related to the HELOC, the home equity line of credit and the stress test. So this is creating a lot of uncertainty. Um, the HELOC, we'll talk about that in, in, um, in a further slide will essentially have an impact on investors and what investors are going to be able to do. And then the, the changes to the stress test should essentially make it slightly easier for first time home buyers to start getting back into the market. But then that's kind of, uh, you know, it's a, it's a double edged sword where stress test is being fixed, but then the interest rates are going up. So 
you know, I, I think this is creating noise and a bit of uncertainty in the market uh, and causing the market to, to function the way it is. Um, there's overall fear in the market. Um, you know, the next interest rate announcement is June 1st. I'm finding that a lot of buyers are saying, you know, let's, let's wait and see what happens with the next interest rate. Let them announce it and then let's see what kind of impact that has on the market, um, on the real estate market. So, you know, we've heard that very famous saying, uh, don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait. That's worked out true. But I think now that latter part of the statement, wait and buy, wait to buy real estate is working to be, you know, playing out to be fairly true. People who kind of waited out in March, waited out in April, you know, they're seeing that price decrease. Um, and they're able to essentially try and time it going forward. Any time from now on, from June 1 onwards, perhaps July would be a really good time to, um, to essentially be active in the market. And Andrew, I know that, you know, we're, we're, we're very involved and, and uh, connected with the, with the investor community. And, you know, I think when we're talking about this, we're talking about that end user, right? That end user who is looking to get into the market. And typically those buyers are working with on-market properties with properties listed on the MLS. So, you know, I know that a lot of investors work with wholesalers and, you know, look for deals off market. And, you know, I think that market could be slightly different, but when we talk about the, the general masses, the overall masses, I would say it's fair to say that they're working with the MLS and, you know, it's, it's, um, I think what they're doing right now is, is correct. Waiting for that June announcement to come and then try and um, uh, see what the impact of that is and, and start shopping uh, June one onwards. Yeah. And, I, and I'll, I'll just add on to that too, is that from an investor perspective, the, the on market trickles down to the off market. Like there, there, there is a relationship between those two because I think right now, a lot of the private sellers are still thinking uh, in their minds what February pricing was like. And so they're holding out for higher offers uh, themselves, even in the off market. And, and we've seen that in the off market deals. They, they seem to have gotten a bit, a bit more expensive, but as, as the interest rates go up and, and, and the MLS market starts to come down and stabilize, then that information will then trickle back. And, and we'll start to see the off market be affected as well. So it could be, um, you know, mutually beneficial uh, for, for a, a first time buyer on MLS or an off market um, investor uh, buying privately. So, yeah, I agree. And you know what, I would say that I, I definitely appreciate the, the work that um, these guys do finding off market properties. And I am seeing often, you know, a, a ton of properties come through and, you know, when I, when I do my analysis, I feel like you're right. I feel like they are slightly behind in the data because the numbers that I see, um, for some of these off market properties, I look at them and I say, this doesn't really make sense. So I recently came across a property where the off market purchase price was lower than a property that is what they were describing it to be. So the off market was higher than what's sold on the MLS. And the whole purpose with this property was to convert it into a duplex. So whereas mm -hmm. a registered duplex on the MLS was trading and actually sold and closed for less than what the wholesaler was offering. So I, I think, you know, as I said, I do appreciate the hard work that they do, but I think they need to get slightly better and more, you know, perhaps educated with, with what's going on with the market. And I don't know if educated is the right word, but I think they need to come come to grasp with having those conversations with the sellers and kind of saying that, look, the, the market has decreased. And in order for this to move off market, it should reflect what's going on with the market. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. There's also maybe an opportunity now to, to start taking a look at the on-market deals because they might yeah. be just as good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, in, in terms of with, uh, with what's going on with Osphere, like, we'll, we'll just talk about this because it, it's relevant to investors. Um, so, Canadians took out $2 billion in HELOC debt um, over the 28 days in February, most in 2022. I suspect that this is essentially, you know, people who start seeing, seeing numbers uh, increase, average prices increase. I'm going to say before 2021, 
And essentially, by the time you get all your documents ready, all your ducks in a row, it essentially takes, you know, a month or so. And then you, we fall into the Christmas break and then they need to work on the application. So I think a big, I, I think a big influx of this could per, perhaps be people who started last year and finally catching up now. But, you know, nevertheless, $2 billion in HELOC debt is still a large number. Um, so based on, I took some, um, some comments right out of the article. So ask me to tighten the mortgage HELOC rule to curb the rising homeowner debt. In January, they made a comment saying that uh, the readvanceable mortgage now makes up a significant portion of uninsured Canadian household mortgage debt. And in that article, they essentially spoke about um, certain changes that may come in the springtime. Um, and of course, they weren't they weren't direct statements as to what was going to happen to changes coming to the HELOC. Um, the comment was they're thinking of making changes, and if they were to make changes, two of the things that they're going to consider is the ability to borrow back equity from home after each principal payment. So I think this is to essentially grow that HELOC. Um, and number two was HELOCs can be used to mask cash flow issues as, a bo as borrowers may have, making it harder for lenders and regulators to detect looming problems, especially in time of crisis. So I think this number two, and Andrew, you can tell me how you interpret this, but I'm, I'm essentially looking at this as using HELOCs to mask cash flow issues. So whether that is people having issues with overall debt and perhaps having you know, problems with debt on higher interest rates. So for example, you know, if people are maxing out credit cards and doing multiple credit cards, those credit cards are running at 19% interest rate. Um, and even unsecured line of credits are running at seven, 8%. Um, I think what, what they're trying to say is that they're noticing a pattern of people taking out home equity line of credits to consolidate debt, which is, you know, not a bad thing if you're reducing a 19% debt and, and carrying a 5% debt. But I think it's, it's essentially saying that you're paying for debt with debt. And the whole purpose of the HELOC um, is that it's supposed to be used with good intentions and with intentions of, of, you know, if you are going to invest it, invest it in a good income producing asset that's supposed to grow rather than pay, pay down, you know, debt. Um, so I think they've noticed that and try, they're trying to discourage people from doing that. Um, that. That's what I took from that statement. I don't know if you have any inputs on, on what you think that means. I think that's a fair assessment, certainly, because, I mean, we, we tend to look at, at things through the eyes of an investor and forget what, you know, 99% of the population is doing, right? And uh, although we use a HELOC to buy properties, that's not what most people do. They use it to buy a car because they don't have any money and they really need a new car or mm -hmm. pay off their debts or whatever. So, you know, given that I've heard numbers, the staggering numbers that, you know, Canada, Canadians as a whole hold the most amount of debt, like than any other like first world country or something. Yeah. Um, that stands to reason that, that maybe they've noticed that HELOCs are being used. Um, yeah. In a way that, in a way that we would see as inappropriate. Yeah, exactly. And essentially what, what they're talking about is that, um, you know, if this is the case, then the banks essentially need to reassess their balance sheet because the portion of the HELOC is supposed to be considered a quote unquote bad debt. And as a result, if you have that bad, bad debt, you need to have more assets to essentially back that, um, that liability. Um, and that increases cost. Um, uh, that increases cost and that cost is likely going to be passed on to the homeowner who's carrying that HELOC. So as a result, the percentage of that HELOC um, should be increasing. So I think that that's bad news for uh, investors, but in fact, uh, better news for first time home buyers as it will, you know, discourage people from using HELOC money to go and buy, you know, property number two, three, four and, and onwards. Yeah. Well, additionally too, though, with the HELOC, I Correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe you have more current information. I haven't used my HELOC to, to as a down payment recently, but I know at the sort of the first beginnings of the pandemic, a lot of the banks put a kibosh on being able to use your HELOC for your down payment anyway. So there's been sort of a progression of of rules put in place that that don't really favor the investor, even though we're using the money wisely. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't know if that's uh, true right now because um, we may have eased off on it. I'm not sure. I, I think so because I'm I'm hearing a lot of investors are doing that at the moment. Oh, there you go. Now, Bank of Canada, Bank of Canada um, made a, a comment that Osby is suggesting it could make a 
an adjustment to its qualifying rate before the end of the year. So as we know, typically right now, when you go to purchase a house, you need to qualify at a higher rate in order to quote unquote stress test your property. Um, they're saying that in each December, they review this um, qualifying rate and they're hoping to, to assess how the market's performing. And as we know, the market is going down. So this is perhaps something that they will adjust and reduce the stress test, which should make it easier for first time home buyers and help them a little bit to, to get into the market. So, you know, um, in terms of what's happening in the market in a shifting market, so because things are changing so quick and, you know, when we talk about what's changing, it's typically prices that are changing. So, you know, the, the one comment I'll make is if you're in the market right now, it actually does not benefit you to have an extremely long closing date because of the uncertainty in the market. And as I mentioned, typically that comes with financing. So what I would recommend and suggest to people is that if you're shopping right now in the market, you want to make sure that you're included financing clause. If you can, I can tell you firsthand that here, when I'm off submitting offers for my clients, I'm submitting them with a financing clause. And the last two have all been accepted. No conversations, no questions, no pushback at all, because I think they also realize that there, there's a, uh, an issue in the market. So request a financing uh, clause if you can and have that conversation. And if that gets accepted, you want to get that done right away within the first week. And even if you don't have a financing clause, you still want to make sure your appraisal is done right away uh, within first within the first five days. It's out of the way. So if the market does come down, you know you don't have an, an issue with going out and getting a, a loan or closing on the property because of because of an appraisal issue. So I want to show everyone this example. So this is a failed closing. Um, so if you look at the bottom. Uh, property 22 park lawn it sold in february for a million 35 it was supposed to close in uh, april 29th um, and it actually did not close and the sellers had to relist it so the top part is then relisting it for 799 um, and reselling it for eight hundred fifty thousand dollars. so there's a one hundred eighty five thousand dollar discrepancy between the last sale price that did not close and the new sale price um, and essentially what's happening with failed closings is that they're becoming very relevant. Um, so typically they're failing because the appraisal is coming back lower. Um, typically people say, you know, in a booming market, they'll say a house is worth what you're willing to pay for it. But in fact, the a house is worth essentially what the bank says it's worth and what an appraisal says it's worth, um, in the eye of the bank who is providing you that 80%, um, loan. If this is the scenario, you can ask for a second opinion, but oftentimes a second opinion doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work. Um, at the end of the day, they're looking at comparables and unless you're able to convince them to look elsewhere, um, then it's likely not going to work. Now, you know, what happens when the value is still low? So when the purchase price is lower than the appraised value. So as a purchaser, you are liable for the difference between purchase price and the appraised value. So, you know, you buy a house for, it's listed for $799, you pay $850,000, appraisal comes back at $800,000, or you're liable for that $50,000 out of pocket. Um, and in addition, um, if you decide not to close on the property, you are essentially liable for any cost that's incurred by the seller as a result of that failed closing. So this could mean if the, if the original seller has to carry the mortgage until they sell it, and there's mortgage expense there, you're liable for that cost. You're liable for the cost of the difference in what it was sold to you versus what it is sold to a new buyer. Um, and then there's also any additional cost that the original seller has to incur. So if they can't close on their purchase, if they've purchased the property and they can't close on that, and let's say they have to borrow a bridge loan and there's interest on that bridge loan, you're liable for that. And then where it gets very, very ugly is if there is a ripple effect and that ripple effect effect goes to the next person and the next house and the next house. So this is why it's so important to essentially have a finance clause right now to ensure that if the property does come in, if the appraisal does come in lower and you can't close, you have an out because that financing clause is to the sole and absolute discretion of the, of the buyer. Absolutely. And typically in these scenarios, you have to cover the lawyer fees on both sides. So this could get well, very ugly. Just out of curiosity, uh, you know, that, that's a, of course, very good advice, but you know, before now putting any condition at all would mean that you lose the, 
the property. So are Correct. we seeing that because the market has settled a bit that, that you can now include conditions again? Yeah, I've noticed that in the Durham region. So speaking for the Durham region, and I would say in, in Oshawa, I'm working with investors and essentially we we uh, submitted on, on a property. We wanted, we had a financing and we had an inspection clause for five business days. Uh, and actually this property over here, 22 Park Lawn, um, this is a property that my client purchased at 850. Um, and uh, yet we had a financing and inspection clause on this property as well. Excellent. So, you know, as an investor, what do you buy today? So I'm just going to quickly go through a scenario. I know we're going uh, over in time, but essentially, you know, I find it in Oshawa, the most, um, uh, the most relevant investment strategy um, with the lowest, you know, barrier to entry is the duplex, um, whether it's a turnkey duplex um, or whether it's a, uh, a single family being converted into a duplex. So I, this is an example right out of the MLS. This actually sold um, recently for 955. So this property that you see is in the Eastdale neighborhood for anyone that knows the Durham region. Um, sold for 955. So essentially what I'm trying to do is um, let's take a look at what a property sold, how much cash you need, um, and what is the rental income expense, cash flow, and ROI on the property. So essentially at 955, if you were to buy a turnkey duplex in Oshawa, you're typically paying around 955. Some of them are higher. Um, the initial cash requires, so that's your 20% uh, down payment, uh, is around $210,000 um, plus closing costs and lawyer fees. Um, in the open market, um, right now in Oshawa, you can get around $4,000 for a two unit. So that's typically around you know $2,300 for a three bedroom upper unit. And then around 17, 18, so that puts us just over 4,000 for a two bedroom, one bathroom basement. Um, typically, I find that these properties need to have availability for at minimum two cars parked tandem, so one and one behind another. So if we look at this property, I ran it on my uh, on my uh, spreadsheet, and I just put a high level summary over here. So total rents would be 4,000, total expense would be 3,961, and that includes our mortgage at a three percent rate taxes, insurance, maintenance reserve, and, uh, and vacancy reserve. So as you can see, the cash flow is, is fairly small, $39 a month. Keep in mind, we do have two non-cash items there with maintenance and vacancy. Um, and that creates an 8% ROI, and ROI I'm calculating as mortgage pay down, annual cash flow, and 0% appreciation just to be conservative. Now, you know, you can, you can say that essentially what I'm trying to show here is let's, let's take a look at what this investment would mean from a cash invested in the property and how much cash is left in the deal if you were to kind of compare to a property that would allow you to refinance. So if we look at a rehab project, again, this purchase price is based on a sale uh, in the area. So it's backed by a comparable. Um, that property, I went and I saw it, purchase price would have been $700,000. The renovation budget that I came up was $120,000. And this was essentially most of the cost going to the lower unit to turn that into a legal accessory apartment. I calculated the after repair value. I said, let's just, you know, compare it and, and use what's recently sold at 955. I think that's a fair after repair value. So if we look at the rehab, the ca initial cash required would be $289,600. So slightly more than the turnkey property. If the refinance goes as planned, um, the cash left in the deal would be around $109,000. So you're able to pull out, um, you know, uh, a bit of your down payment that you've put on the property, but you would still leave some some of that renovation budget in, in the property. Total rents would be forty one hundred dollars a month because you have a nicer property. You can demand a bit more of a premium because of how the the, the place looks. Um, cash flow increases slightly, but so does ROI, which is nice. Now, I think what's really important for investors to realize is that. The after repair value right now is a risk item that you need to consider because of the uncertainty in the market. We don't really know what is going to happen to the market once this rehab project is done, which could take six to eight months. So something that investors need to, to, to realize is that they need to be able to stress test this property and perhaps look at a 10% correction. So, if this property was to was to experience a 10% correction in the after repair value, what happens to the property? So the after repair value would come down to 850. Um, 
as you can see, the cash left in the deal is now slightly more. So you're around $193,000 left in the deal. Um, your cash flow increases because you have a smaller mortgage, but then your ROI um, is down as is down uh, subsequently. So you know something for people to consider um, and get comfortable with. And I think the point that we're trying to make here is that you know you need to stress test the property and assume that your after repair value could be higher or could be lower because of the uncertainty in the market. Absolutely. And if you're a cash flow investor, then you're going to like the second one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there's Oshawa in a nutshell. There's some amazing information. Uh, of course, as always, if you, if you like what you see, remember to like, subscribe. And if you want to see next month's issue, hit the notification bell. Saman, it's been amazing being the host with you. I learned a lot myself. I, I, I'm somewhat unfamiliar with Oshawa being a West mm -hmm. End investor. It's just full yes. of information. I really appreciate it. Yes. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for hosting and, and giving us your time. And for anyone who has, you know, questions about what we spoke about, comment sections open. I address those comments on the regular. And if anyone's interested, more than happy to jump on a call with me with through my Calendly um, link that we ha will have in the comment section below. Uh, I'm often talking to people about what they can do, taking them out and showing them property. So if you want to talk about your personal situation, I'm happy to do that as well. And can we follow you on social media? Do you have a preferred handle? Absolutely. Yes. Um, typically on Instagram at Simon Habibi underscore real estate. And recently I've been um, very active on Twitter as well, posting uh, data um, and we're getting a lot of buzz and, um, you know, creating a lot of conversations, good conversations there. And on Twitter it would be Simon Habibi underscore R E and that would be for real estate. That's perfect. And of course it's all going to be in the comments if you didn't get a chance to remember that. I, of course, am Andrew Cox on Facebook and Andrew Cox REI everywhere else. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. And uh, thanks for joining us all. Until next time, take care.